Well, I think it's, I think, you really want to know what I think? I think it's revenge yes. against God for the crime of being. <laughs> and Cain, Cain and Abel. It's like, oh, Abel's your, Abel's your guy, eh, God? How about if I take him out in the field and beat him to death? Hey, y'all. It's Pip, and I've got a good one for y'all today. Uh, we're going to be talking about Jordan Peterson, and I want to do a deep dive, kind of exploring his evolution, starting from his rise to prominence in 2016, to when he fell off the map, and to what he's been doing recently as he's trying to make a resurgence and a comeback in his career as an angry old white guy who hates trans people. And we're doing this video today, and why I'm so excited is because this affects me personally. When I was younger, I was a big Jordan Peterson fan. I thought he was really smart. I thought he made good points. And then I grew up. Um, so what I want to do today is go over some of these old clips, um, things that I know I had seen and that I had been like, wow, this is really smart. Uh, but then talk about why actually, no, they're insane. And we're just going to talk about a whole bunch of other stuff in there too. So that's what we're going to be doing today. If this is the kind of content you're interested in, please make sure to like down below, you know, subscribe, comment, do all that good stuff. Helps the channel out, helps this video out a lot, and helps me know to produce more content like this. So anyway, let's get into it. Jordan Peterson, if you've never heard of him, he is a Canadian psychologist. He used to teach at Harvard at the University of Toronto, and he got onto international fame, burst onto the stage, in 2016 because he did not want to use trans people's preferred pronouns. And what was so smart about what he used to do and the content he used to do, let's be clear, was very, very good right-wing content. Um, it was so smart because instead of making the argument about should I say these pronouns, he was able to frame it um, under the Canadian Bill C-16 as this idea that the government is here to force speech upon people that his objection wasn't to trans people or to using pronouns of trans people that his objection was just to the government uh for doing this bill so here's how he framed the issue and, and so then the claim comes up well if someone wants you to use a particular pronoun then you're disrespecting them if you don't it's like hmm okay let's think that through a bit well that assumes that when i'm using he or she for for people in you know in normal parlance that i'm actually indicating my respect for them and that's not true it's like if i don't know you i class classify you generically and basically i classify you in terms of how you present yourself publicly i suppose that's your gender expression and then I nail you with whatever pronoun seems to fit. It has nothing to do with respect. And besides that, you bloody... So there he is uh, saying that, you know, I mean, honestly, the pronoun stuff, it's not even about respect at all, which we're going to get to. And then here is where he tries to explain that actually, no, uh, it's much more severe than whether or not this is about respect or not. It's about the government compelling speech. Okay, so now I'm comp a person is compelled under Canadian law to use the pronoun of another individual's choice by on pain of law. And I thought, well, no, that's not acceptable. It's one thing to put limits on what a person can't say, like say with hate speech laws, which I also don't agree with, by the way, but that's a different argument. I, th I think it's a narrower argument. But to compel me to use a certain content when I'm formulating my thoughts or my actions under threat of legislative action, I thought, no, what's happened there is the government has introduced compelled speech legislation into the private sphere. It's never happened in the... Okay, so that's how Jordan Peterson frames it. And this is going on in Canada. So, of course, nobody knows what's happening because nobody cares about Canada. Uh, like your average person, most of his audience is in America, um, and, and your average person doesn't know. Now, the specifics of what's going on in that law was simply that it was a one-page little addendum to a law that they have, you know, anti-discrimination laws, where it says, you know, you have to treat people the same on the basis of race, gender, religion, sex, you know. Everybody knows these. You, you see them everywhere. They just wanted to add uh, uh, sexual orientation or, or gender or orientation. I, I forget the exact word. But anyway, so that you can't discriminate against trans people just because they're trans. Um, and he claimed that the, that the government is just going to come in and they're going to start mass arresting people if you don't use their compelled speech. 
Now, this was completely not true. No one has ever been arrested since this was put in six years ago, but it didn't matter. He blew up for this and he sort of became a way for everyone who didn't want to use a transgender person's preferred pronouns as having the appearance that this is just an intellectual thing, that this is a free speech issue, while getting to mask the fact that really they just don't like trans people. That's fundamentally what it is. Because think about what he's really said. His argument about respect is horrible. He said, pronouns aren't about respect. Everyone on the planet has a pronoun, a he or she, you know, four billion, four billion guys, four billion girls. Um, it's not a respect thing. That's stupid. Uh, everyone on the planet has a name. Okay, and when you first meet a person, it's true. You, you don't know their name, so you ask. And then, once you know what they prefer to be called, if you don't call them that, yeah, that's disrespectful. Look, like when I was a kid, I'm my name's Pippin. You know, I would get called Pipsqueak a lot. And I really didn't like it. Um, I, Like, if you know that I don't like being called pipsqueak and you continue to use that as, you know, a, a very minor, you know, second grade level, like way to bully someone. Yeah, of course that's disrespectful. That's the exact same thing that's happening with pronouns. If you know that someone wants to be called say she and you call them he, of course that's disrespectful. And, and you might think that's in your prerogative or whatever. Like, honestly, for this discussion, I don't even care. But the idea that it's not about respect is insane. But nobody cared about that side of the argument. That's dumb. They just wanted to amplify this legalistic side of things uh, because that seems defensible if you don't know what this Canadian bill is going on. So Jordan Peterson, he became huge. He blew up. Um, look, Jordan Peterson was making bank uh, on... This is just on Patreon alone um, at the time when he's up at his peak. Um, he was making $80,000 a month. That's a million bucks a year just on Patreon. Not to mention he has a huge YouTube following. He goes and does speeches. This is a part-time in addition to the work he's doing as a professor. Like, everybody's listening to this guy now. Um, just because he doesn't like trans people. Um, and so he does that and he sort of nominally tries to brand himself as like the self-help psychologist. So he comes out with a book called 12 Rules for Life. And the rules are meh. They're okay, I guess. Uh, like it's hit or miss. You know, some of them uh, treat yourself like you're someone you're responsible for helping. Yeah, I'm with that. Make friends with people who want the best for you. That's good. Uh, compare yourself to who you were yesterday, not to who someone else is today. Like, Okay, yeah, he's got some good rules. I, I mean, I guess, like, if you need to hear somebody say that, like, oh, okay. I, he's also got some bad ones in here. Um, Like, do not let your children do anything that makes you dislike them. Which is really weird for a psychologist who's really big on, like, personal responsibility and the idea that you need to be in control of yourself. And it's like, whoa, why are you framing this as if it's this passive thing where, like, your children make you dislike them. And there's, you know, that's just what it is. Not like, hey, like your children, even if they do something stupid. And then also the whole do not let your children do anything, you know, as if like they're little robots that like you just control and program. I mean, they're other people and parents have a huge amount of sway over how their kids turn out, but not 100%. And at some point you have to let your kids go and you have to let them be other people. So like, that's a little sus. Um, here's the big one that I hate. How about set your house in perfect wor order before you criticize the world? Now, he uses this a lot to try and attack the left. Um, and what he does is, and we're going to show a clip of this in a second, is anytime somebody talks about like a big issue, something that you aren't individually in control of, like let's say the environment, he will, in theory, support the idea of social justice or collective action or collective responsibility. But then in practice, anytime somebody tries to do this, he will attack them as, as not having their house in order, whatever that means, 
and saying that, look, if you don't have everything perfect within your little domain, you shouldn't be talking about the collective domain. Okay, so here's an example of, of him doing this um, in a Australian uh, sort of Q&A thing. Uh, because the argument I think is the individual responsibility does not change um, the climate, does not fix the problem that needs global collective responsibility. So I think that's the core of the question. Do you have a, a theory about that? Well, fundamentally, I'm a psychologist, and my experience has been that people can do a tremendous amount of good for themselves and for the people who are immediately around them by looking to their own inadequacies and their own flaws and the things that they're not doing in their lives and starting to build themselves up as more powerful individuals and if they're i just want to pause it here like like that is bonkers and you know when when he said that like four years ago and i was young and like a freshman in college it, it didn't really strike me as as anything crazy but like think about what he's saying he's saying like if you care about the climate you shouldn't talk about it uh, or complain or go to protest or do any sort of activism uh, unless you've already got your life perfect. Or, you know, you should only can uh, complain about things that you have 100% control over. Like, the fact of the matter is, you as an individual are not doing anywhere near enough damage to the climate on your own to be able to try and slow or reverse the negative environmental effects that we're seeing all across the country. And you might not be able to wait until you're in a position of power, if that ever happens for you, uh, to where you can make those changes. Um, people can do both. But of course, he doesn't want that because he wants to undermine any sort of activism and he does this on climate, he does this on, on race, he does this on gender issues, he does this on with the trans community, all the time, all the time. Let's get back to him. ...capable of doing that, and then they're capable of expanding their career. And if they're capable of expanding their career and their competence, then they're capable of taking their place in the community as effective leaders. And then they're capable of making wise decisions instead of unwise decisions when it comes to making collective political decisions. I'm not suggesting in the least and have never suggested that there's no domain for social action. I'm suggesting that people who don't have their own houses in order should be very careful before they go about reorganizing the world, which happens in many ways. Yeah. Now, that's stupid, but it appears intellectually defensible. Basically, what he's saying is he doesn't believe in democracy. He believes that a certain select group of essentially elites who have their house in order whatever that means, should be the ones making decisions about society. And that you, John Doe, or you, Jane Doe, shouldn't have a say because your life probably sucks, right? You probably have issues. And if you don't have a perfect life, why are you talking about society? Um, this is the sort of way that he never explicitly says anything uh, uh, fascist or, or incredibly authoritarian, but... By implication, you just have to take one more step and then you're there at this sort of highly authoritarian ideology that, that he's trying to, to get at. Um, and so this is so, so common. And where it really begins to show is when he talks about postmodernism, which he does a lot. You know, when he talks about, say, like environmental issues, he just thinks that people are pseudo-moralistic and that annoys him. But when it comes to other issues, you know, race or gender or, or the trans community or, or abortion or a whole host of issues, he frames them under the domain of postmodernism. And he describes this as a horrible ideology that's undermining society and is going to kill millions of people. So this is the start of a 45 minute talk he did on postmodernism and cultural Marxism. Let me just play like 30 seconds so you get a flavor of it. And then we're gonna talk about the interview at a high level. I don't think that you can understand the current situation properly without considering the role that postmodernism plays in this. Because postmodernism in many ways, especially as it's played out politically, is the new skin that the old Marxism now inhabits. 
So you could think that there's, there's a postmodern philosophy, which we'll talk about a bit, that really came into its vogue in the 1970s after classic Marxism, especially of the economic type, had been so thoroughly discredited that no one but an absolute reprobate could, 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 uh, could support it publicly anymore. Even the French intellectuals had to admit that communism was a bad deal by the, by the end of the 1960s. And what happened was that there, they played a sleight of hand game in some sense and rebranded themselves under the postmodern guise. And that's where... It... Okay, so what is he saying? He's saying that there is a group of, of powerful people who had this ideology, Marxism, that's killed 100 million people and they want to implement it in our society, but they can't do it under the name Marxism, so they call it postmodernism, and they rebrand it, and he's then going to spend 44 more minutes talking about how this postmodernism, this cultural Marxism, is just the end of society, essentially. Now, your average person uh, doesn't use the term postmodernism in regular parlance. They don't know what it means, uh, and for, I mean, good reason. Like, it, it's, you know, an esoteric academic philosophy. Like, if you're a plumber, who cares? Um, and say that cultural Marxism isn't something a lot of people have heard of. So uh, let me just refer us all to Wikipedia for just a, a very standard, a very easily Googleable definition of cultural Marxism, which is true. The term cultural Marxism refers to a far-right anti-Semitic, anti-Semitic, we're going to come back to that, but refers to a far-right anti-Semitic conspiracy theory, which claims that Western Marxism is the basis of continuing academic and intellectual efforts to subvert Western culture. The conspiracy theory misrepresents the Frankfurt School as being responsible for modern progressive movements, identity politics, and political correctness, claiming there is an ongoing and intentional subversion of Western society via a planned culture war that undermines the Christian values of traditional conservatism and seeks to replace them with the culturally liberal values of the 1960s. Now, I obviously can't play the whole interview. Of course, links down below in the description if you don't believe me. But like, this is exactly what Jordan Peterson is saying. He talks about the Frankfurt School a ton. You've already heard him talk about into the 60s, early 70s, how they're they're bringing in ideas uh, from you know these French intellectuals. Um, what are like the next words out of his mouth here? Politics came from, and so identity politics, and then that spread like wildfire from France, especially into the U.S. through Yale University, through the English department there, and then everywhere. And and so, what happened was. Okay, okay. I uh, we don't need to get into the weeds of it. Um, but the point is, like, this is exactly what he's talking about. And now you say, well, why is this anti-Semitic? We never mentioned Jews anywhere. Okay, like, where is this coming from? And I know, I think I vaguely heard that this idea was anti-Semitic back when I was in like the end of high school, and I was like, what the what? Um, so let me just explain it. This is almost word for word um, a, a Nazi talking point known as cultural Bolshevism, which basically said the same thing, um, except replace postmodernists with Jews. And ultimately, this culminates in Nazi ideology. Because just think about it. If you have a group of powerful people behind the scenes who are controlling everything, who are evil for some unknown reason, just want people dead, and you know it. What do you do? They're going to kill 100 million more people. Look, at the minimum, you're going to round them all up and put them in prison. Uh, uh, but if they get executed or, you know, they die, eh, you know, is anyone going to complain and cry? Like, no, no. That's ultimately what this leads to. He'll never say it. Um, but just ask, like, who are these postmodernists? Who are these woke people? Who are these crazed intellectuals? For a lot of people, this is Jews. If you're familiar with hyper alt-right movements or, or like the neo-Nazi groups in the US today, they'll say it. They'll say it's the Jews. For Jordan Peterson, it might be a different group. It might be trans people. It might be academics in the humanities. It might be feminists. I don't know because he only ever says things by implication, but it's very, very clear 
what this ideology leads to. And it would lead to, if everyone believed this is true, and they had the power to do something about it, they would round up all these people before this killer ideology spreads too far. This is fundamentally what Jordan Peterson wants, okay? And so this guy who's branding himself as just giving advice and he's just saying, hey, don't try and change the world unless you have your house in order. And then he's gonna say, look who doesn't have their house in order. These people, they're crazy. They shouldn't be allowed to make decisions. That's what he wants. He wants to disempower, disenfranchise, and ultimately imprison these groups of people. And it is, to me, highly ironic that he makes this claim about you shouldn't try and influence you know, the larger communities unless you have your house in order. Because while he's doing this, he is suicidal and addicted to Benzos. For almost two years, this happens. Um, so it ends up getting so bad that at the end of 2019, um, he ends up going to Russia for a controversial treatment where they induced a coma for eight days to try and help get them out of this. He goes, I don't remember anything from December 16th, 2019 to February 5th, 2020. That's almost two months. Two months of his life that he doesn't remember because he's got to get treated because his drug addiction is so bad because his life is out of control. And um, he got addicted. He started struggling with an addiction to benzos prescribed to him after a violent reaction to a strict meat and greens diet, which is just like, I mean, I already think Jordan Peterson plays a lot of games and is trying to mask the eight ball when it comes to his authoritarian fascist ideologies. But like this, I mean, he's, he just lies about stuff. Like he went on Joe Rogan for 30 minutes in 2018 while he's addicted to benzos, while he's depressed and suicidal and spends 30 minutes, again, not explicitly telling people to be carnivores, just spending 30 minutes talking about how the carnivore diet cured his depression and shoot, maybe it would work for you. Been on a pure carnivore diet for about two months and a pretty, a very, very low carb, greens only, modified carnivore diet for about a year. So in the year. And, 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 and a low carb diet for two years. So from the time that I've known you, I've known you for what, two and a half years now, something like yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. When I first met you, you had much more weight on your body. Yeah. You looked different. Yeah. And you were, back then you were eating like the standard diet, right? Like normal yeah, people do. Yes. Diet. Pasta, bread, meat, yes. chicken, whatever. Yes. Right? You shifted over to only meat and greens. I saw you and I'm like, you look fantastic. I'm like, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. And you're like, I changed. Okay. I, I don't want to listen to any more of this because they just go on and on. But like the point here is, is very clear. Like. Once again, he's doing what he always does. He's just spouting craziness and not explicitly saying what to do, but he's got his ideologies that are very clear. So whatever. So he goes into this coma. He has these huge health issues. It takes him a long time to recover. He falls off the map. You know, he's no longer making 80 grand a month off Patreon. Okay. Um, and for about two years, he sort of wasn't in the public domain. I, I sort of thought he was gone. But at the start of this year, he came back. He decided he wants to be a public figure again. So in January, he quits his tenured professorship at the University of Toronto, and he publishes an op-ed titled, Why I'm, I Am No Longer a Tenured Professor at the University of Toronto. And his subtitle is, The Appalling Ideology of Diversity, Inclusion, and Equity is Demolishing Education and... <coughs> <coughs> is demolishing education and business. So now this is just silly. We're just going to read a couple of excerpts of his reasons for why he's doing this. Um, but basically, it's just he, he doesn't like diversity. That's all it is. He is now, after his drug use, is no longer able to just do all this implicit stuff of sort of giving cover to much further right-leaning ideologies. He's now much more explicit with what he believes, and I think much less impactful because of that. So what are his reasons for quitting? 
First, my qualified and supremely trained heterosexual white male grad students face a negligible chance of being offered university research positions. Um, and he says this is because of diversity and inclu inclusivity and equity mandates. Okay, which he rails on. Um, <clears throat> and he basically calls these multiple reasons, but it's all the same. You know, he says a second reason is, you know, just that this appalling ideology is demolishing universities and ultimately general culture uh, because there's not simply enough qualified black indigenous people of color people in the pipeline to meet diversity targets. Okay, again, just he doesn't like diversity. Um, and so he goes on further to uh, get upset at the fact that some of his colleagues allow himself themselves to undergo anti-bias training, uh, which he says is conducted by unqualified HR personnel. Um, he doesn't like the fact that people have to craft diversity statements to obtain a research grant. He says everyone's just lying. Like, this is just conspiracy theory stuff. Like, he's just saying that there's a conspiracy theory to promote diversity in a way that undercuts talent, and he can't take it. And when in reality, HR personnel at universities are probably some of the most trained people on the planet at identifying their own bias, working to mitigate it. It's why hiring efforts are often done in group panels where they bring in different uh, people with different backgrounds with biases to try and mitigate the effects of any one person's bias, multiple rounds. Anyone who's getting in there has good qualifications, okay? But of course, in his mind, he's gonna play up the qualifications of his white male grad students and he's gonna downplay the qualifications of anybody who's not that and say that the reason why there's all this diversity isn't because we're now training more and more qualified, you know, black students or female students or indigenous students, but that it's because the standards are higher for white people and lower for everybody else just to let unqualified people in. Totally not true. No evidence to support this. No reason to believe this. He's just asserting that. And so since he quit being a professor, he's now trying to make his income uh, based on being a public figure. So he's going on, doing a bunch of talks, podcasts, those sorts of things. So at this point, we're just going to laugh. We're just going to look at some of the crazy stuff that he's done over the past couple of months because it's funny. Here's a clip uh, from when he went on Joe Rogan and he talks about the Bible and he's so off. But you've heard too much of me, so let me let uh, an Oxford theologian explain what's wrong uh, with just some of the segments JP is saying. In many ways, the first book was the Bible. There are zero meaningful ways in which the first book was the Bible. I mean, literally, because at one point there was only one book, like as far as our Western culture is concerned, there was one book. So there was never a time when this was true, not even within Western culture. But I do note that Jordan Peterson makes grand sweeping claims and then says, I only care about Western culture. But Western culture was primarily built on classical literature anyway. So we were talking about meaning in text because we were talking about translation and the problem of understanding text. And ah, we're getting into my field. I wonder how Dr. Peterson will misrepresent another field that is not his own. The postmodernists make that case that all meaning is derived from the relationship between words. That's, that's wrong because, well, what about rage? That's not words. And what about moving your hand? That's not words. So it's wrong. But So I've been racking my brain trying to think of a way to make this criticism make sense without having to conclude that Dr. Peterson is saying that postmodernists think that there is no meaning that exists outside of linguistic expression. And if that is what Dr. Peterson is saying, he does not have the first clue what postmodernism is. The I mean, <clears throat> of course he doesn't have a clue. To him, postmodernism is just this Jewish conspiracy, right? It Look, look, this is a classic thing. Jordan Peterson tries to be like an intellectual on every topic. And of course, he's he's not. Um, so I just thought it was funny to see somebody who's actually trained and who's in a, that relative field for what Jordan Peterson is saying, talking about the nonsense coming out of Jordan Peterson. Here's Jordan Peterson talking about Antifa. Mob violence. When I see it, it, it. Uh, like I, I don't even recognize some of these. It seem they seem animalistic, is what I mean. Um, in, no, they're the worse than animals. 
They're worse than animals because animals, they just kill to eat, you know? Human beings, they have a twist in them that makes them far worse than animals when they really get going. Well, I think it's, I think, you really want to know what I think? I think it's revenge yes. against God for the crime of being. <laughs> That's really what I think. It's Cain. And Cain, Cain and Abel. It's like, oh, Abel's your, Abel's your guy, eh, God? How about if I take him out in the field and beat him to death? How do you feel about <laughs> I, I can't. I, how do you not laugh at this guy? He's out of his mind. Insane. Like, he's trying to talk about Portland and, and the the Chaz Zone. And, and his level of analysis is Cain killed Abel. Like, what is he saying? How does anybody take this guy seriously? So that's, that's the crazy. Then let's just talk about the mean. So, okay, this is a Sports Illustrated cover. It's their swimsuit edition. As you can see, this model is plus size. Jordan Peterson feels the need to retweet this to his followers, saying, sorry, not beautiful. And no amount of authoritarian tolerance is going to change that. Like, what? What? Like, what? Who cares? Who, who cares about any of this? Like, that's just... Like, there's no political point here. I, I don't plus size people buy swimsuits. Of course, you should put some plus size swimsuits on your swimsuit stuff. But, like, of course, he's freaking out. He thinks this is a cultural standard that's been lost. He received a lot of uh, backlash from, you know, normies for this. Um, but let's talk about another tweet where he got more than just, you know, a bunch of people tweeting at him saying that he's an idiot. Um... Let's talk about how he got his account suspended uh, because he, he tweeted uh, about Elliot Page being transgender and basically called it a sin. So <clears throat> his quote is, remember when pride was a sin and Ellen Page just had her breasts removed by a criminal physician. So Elliot Page, formerly known as Ellen Page, is a trans man. Ellen Page, you know, was, was in uh, Inception, right? Uh, came out later as being transgender you know, changed his name, changed his pronouns, uh, just recently, or at some point had, had a double mastectomy, whatever, adult, trans person, even if you think being trans is, is wrong, I, I don't understand what to get upset at, like, like, just, it's an adult making a choice about their body, I, I mean, wouldn't you think that right-wingers who, it was only a couple years ago, pretended that they sh were just libertarians and wanted the government to just get out of everybody's way and let people live their life. Of course, no, no. We're seeing the theocrat come out of Jordan Peterson. So, uh, you know, just talking about about Elliot Page uh, by his old name, which I, I guess I could understand the pronoun thing. You don't like pronouns. What's wrong with changing your name? What's anyway, uh, and, and then calling the idea of having uh, breasts removed as criminal, uh, which once again, just highlights that like Jordan Peterson wants these people in jail, right? He believes that this physician is a butcher, someone who's mutilating other people for pleasure. Okay. Uh, and not just a doctor performing gender affirming care, right? What's the natural outcome if you believe that these, these physicians are butchers and mutilators? Shouldn't they all be rounded up? It's just Nazi ideology. Um, just with a slightly different new skin. So anyway, Jordan Peterson uh, got suspended for Twitter for this. They said you have to take down uh, the tweet um, to get your account back. He refused. Uh, the same day Jordan Peterson announced that he is uh, on Daily Wire Plus. Um, and they'd already had all of uh, his stuff up on Daily Wire Plus and yada yada. Anyway, this was clearly just a stunt to try and launch Jordan Peterson into Daily Wire um, and, and get a bunch of attention uh, over this cancel culture ideology. So anyway, that, that happened about two months ago. And uh, since then, I mean... I. I, he just, it's just stupid. Um, it's now more and more of Jordan Peterson saying what he actually thinks, which I think is far less effective because when you hear out loud everything that Jordan Peterson thinks, I think your average person knows he's crazy. Whereas instead he used to come right up to the line 
and then let you or let you know an alt-right friend or another alt-right commentator take you further while he tries to hold uh, what seems to be a defensible claim. So like, here's him talking about why Russia invaded Ukraine. This is his analysis. Putin constantly tells his people that he sees us falling far too far under the sway of ideas very similar to those that produced the revolutionary frenzy of the communist movement and detailed so presciently by Dostoevsky in The Devils and analyzed for their catastrophic consequence so carefully by Solzhenitsyn. And whether he believes this or not, and I believe he does, he is certainly able and willing to use the story of our degeneration to make his people wary of us and to convince them of the necessity of his leadership and to unite them in supporting his actions in Ukraine. Okay, so just in case you zoned out for that, Peterson is saying that Putin invaded Ukraine because the United States is degenerate and he needs to stop that. And, and what he's going to do is claim that, yeah, actually the US is degenerate. Once again, total fascist talking point. Um, and he's going to say that this degeneracy, a great example of it, has to do with Kentonji Brown Jackson being appointed to the Supreme Court. And are we degenerate in a profoundly threatening manner? I think the answer to that may well be yes. The idea that we are ensconced in a culture war has become a rhetorical commonplace. How serious is that war? Is it serious enough to increase the probability that Russia, say, will be motivated to invade and potentially incapacitate Ukraine merely to keep the pathological West out of that country, which is a key Absolutely part of the historically insane. Russian sphere of influence? To answer that question, I'll turn to the analysis of a recent sequence of significant events in the US with broader ramifications for the development of political thought in the West as such. When the Biden administration began the process of identifying a new Supreme Court justice, a singular message was initially trumpeted. It is time for a black woman to take her place in the highest tribunal in the land. <laughs> okay. Um, he took forever to get to his point, but he finally made it. Um, diversity. He hates it. And he's going to go on later to talk about how, uh, Kentonji Brown Jackson was asked, uh, you know, what is a woman? Um, and, and that of course he freaks out at her response. And because again, right, he, he doesn't like non-white cis guys and trad wives. Um, so that's Jordan Peterson's ideology. That's his talking points. And I'm done. I, I'm, I'm, I've showed y'all too much. Uh, but I hope that this helped try and explain sort of Jordan Peterson, how he used to argue when it was effective, talk about some of those underlying uh, uh, issues behind what he was saying, and how these underlying issues are now being made more explicit as he's trying to have a resurgence into the popular light. And hopefully, you come away thinking that this guy is absolutely insane, and you don't fall for any of the sorts of things he's saying, either now or in the past. Thanks so much for watching this video. Hope you enjoyed it.